to meet with Jesus here in this place tonight. <clears throat> so Jesus, as we come to you in worship, as we offer you these songs, as we sing these songs, God, I pray that they would be more than just words that we sing, more than just words that we say, more than just um, music that we listen to, but Lord, that they would really be expressions of our heart to you. God, giving you thanks for all that you have done for us, the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross, but Lord, also for just who you are. You're the true God, and you're the one who reigns for all eternity. There's no one that compares to you. And so you're deserving of our worship and our praise tonight, our full attention. All of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our mind, and all of our strength. Let, it, let us give that to you tonight, because it's what you deserve. And as we worship you, Lord, would you make yourself known just as your word says, as we draw near to you, you draw near to us. So we take these next moments to draw near to you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. And see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Yes, He has done great things. Sing it out, O hero. O oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, oh you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, oh you have done great things. through every storm and you'll be faithful forevermore you have done great things and I know you will do it again for your promises yes and amen or you will do great things oh God you do great things hero of heaven you conquer the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god oh you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god oh you have done great things Sing hallelujah, hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. A hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, oh you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, oh, you have done great things, oh, you have done great things, oh God. 
Lord, you are great tonight, and we thank you for the great things that you have done.
you get shy on me and lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. All that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. challenge you tonight just a little bit. I want to sing that chorus one more time, but I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to lift your hands and put your attention on Him, just as it says, I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Maybe something you've never done before, but don't worry about what other people are going to think or anything else. Just sing praise to Jesus. We have to think. I actually heard a message this week. And it was it was challenging because it was like, would what would I do if a very well-known celebrity walked into this room. What would we do? What if the President of the United States walked into this room? Would we just stand around and be like, oh, cool? No, we'd be like, whoa, why are they here? If it was your favorite sports star, We'd just be like, oh, cool. No, you'd be super excited, right? You'd want their attention, and you'd give them your attention, right? How much more attention should we give Jesus? He gave his life for us. And he's not just some distant person that we just observe on a screen, watching the latest music video, watching their best game performance, making the next touchdown, making the next whatever. So I just challenge you to think, okay, here's someone who loved me so much that they died for me. And they're real. Jesus is real. He's in this room tonight. So as we, again, focus our attention on him, let him reveal himself to you. So again, let's sing this chorus one more time. And again, I want to challenge you to close your eyes. I don't want anyone looking around. Close your eyes. Put your focus on him. And ask him. Say, Jesus, I want to know you. Would you show yourself to me tonight? Ask him. See what happens. See what happens.
So let's close our eyes. Let's put our attention on him. And as the song says, as we lift our hands in praise to him. Jesus. Jesus. There's no one more worthy tonight of our worship. No one more worthy of our attention tonight. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah, a hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, oh hallelujah. I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, oh hallelujah. much, nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, oh Nothing matters more. There's nothing I want more. Cause nothing matters more. And the 
There's nothing I want more. There's nothing matters more. I'll just be here at your feet. Just be here on my knees. Here in your presence, I am complete. Jesus, you're all that I need, and I'll just be here at your feet, just be here on my knees, here in your presence I am complete, Jesus, you're all that I need, Jesus, you're all that I need, Jesus, all that I need. Yes, Jesus, it's you that we need tonight. And so again, as we continue through tonight, Lord, let us know that in you, let us experience that in you, we're complete. We're made whole. We're satisfied. Jesus, you're the one who truly satisfies. The desire, the longing of our heart, Help us to realize that the things of this world are empty. God, and it's you that we need and really desire. Thank you for this time with you. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys can find your seat. Get ready to hear the message from Pastor Sean. That one's on, so I'll grab this one. Well, hello there. I'm going to get a drink of agua first. Huh? No. It was just, I said it was on already. I saw the green light, so I picked this one up. All right. <coughs> I had some thirst quenching agua. Um, but last week. We started what series? Yes, but was the main title? It was technically four words, but three words. Awesome. God, guys, and girls. It's three main words, but there's four words on there. And so we are continuing. Last week, the main point, who remembers what the main point was last week? Like at the end, I was like, if you remember one main point, this would be it. That you wholeheartedly pursue a relationship with whom? All right. That was the main point. Now tonight we are diving into number two of our relationship series, God, Guys, and Girls. And so I'm going to share a little story again like I did last week. But when I was in high school, as you guys found out last week, um, I shared uh, the first time I had asked a girl on a date. But when I was in high school, uh, I didn't really do a lot of dating. That one singular date was the only date that I went on in high school. And then I proceeded to go to college. I didn't really date in college. I just, there was nobody that I was really interested in. And then I went to Bible school. Well, I went to my first college. And then, um, for those of you that don't know, I was enrolled. Let's see here. I was enrolled at... Indiana Westland, IU, Central Bible College, Evangel University. Um, 
I do tech. I technically was enrolled in SAGU, but I never went. So I went to a lot of a lot of colleges in six years. But when I was in college, I didn't really date a whole lot. And I graduate college, and I met Kayla when I was 25 years old. I will be 31 this month. And so, thank you. That I know you say that, and in a way, that still helps me feel young because I know there's people in this room that are older than me, and when you call me old, they're te- they got little tears coming out because they're older than I am. And so you're hurting them even more than you're hurting me by saying that I'm old. I just want you to know that you're hurting a group of people. <coughs> but thank you. I appreciate it. <coughs> All right. So when after college, um, this point, I am 25 years old, and I meet Kayla. She is still in college. Um, Kayla's four years younger than I am. But I meet Kayla and the um, funny thing is, we didn't instantly hit it off. And she will still tell you to this day that the first time we met, what do you think her thoughts of me were? That I was rude. <laughs> she thought I was this guy that was extremely rude, and but it was through the process of our friends setting up several times where us where the four of us would get together um, my friend and his wife and then Kayla and I and we would get together we would hang out after church um, we'd go play disc golf or something um, and through spending time with one another um, ultimately I ended up talking with her dad um, getting to know him before I officially asked Kayla out um, but then we began dating when I was 25 and then a year later I proposed and we're married so and we have Jonathan now but a few months of that go by after we start dating. And there was this moment where this little word came into the mix. Who, who knows what this little word, I'm t- it's a four-letter word. This wor- you there, what is this, Xander? So this word called love pops into this conversation. And, um, and so... And I remember the first time I said it, I called her. I was getting off work, and I said, hey, can you?" she was still at Evangel. I met her outside of her dorm. I got off work. I drove over to Evangel, and I told her, I love you for the first time. Um, I remember that right outside her dorm, and her roommate actually happened to be, like, right off in the distance and, like, realized what was taking place, and it was kind of funny. But anyway, we're continuing on with guys, God, guys, and girls. And so we're going to talk about relationships, and tonight we're going to focus on Two four-letter words, which one of them is what already? And what do you think the other one is? If you'd have to guess, a contrasting word to the word love that also starts with an L and it's four letters. Lust. So the title tonight is Love Not Lust. So let's pray. So God, we just ask that right now, Lord, that you just open our heart. As we dive into your word, I pray that we can focus on you tonight, that you can challenge us in ways maybe you haven't challenged us before to help focus our relationship on you um, and put you first in our relationship with others. And in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to look at both of these words tonight. So what is love? I I was wondering if somebody would start singing something. But... Hey, everybody's got their own song. All right. But we're going to look at a biblical understanding of what is love, what does the Bible say, and how many know that the Bible talks a lot about love? The Bible talks a lot about love. And there are um, two passages that talk a little more in depth. We're not going to read mass amounts of Scripture tonight, but we're going to look at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. So you can turn there if you got your Bible. You can look at the notes. If you don't have some notes, you can go to the back of the room real quick and grab some notes. Or you can look at the screen, the sky version. So, there's a lot of fill in the blanks on the notes tonight. So to help you focus and pay attention. 
So first John chapter four, starting in verse seven. It says, Dear friends, let us continue to what? Love one another. For what? Love comes from God. Anyone who is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not, does not know God. For God is awesome. So God is the source of love. He's not just the source. He is the, he is love. That's what John is saying, that he is so much of the source of love that he is the creator of love. God is love. So ultimately, if we really want to know love, we need to get to know who? God. So if we really want to know love, we need to get to know God. So the second section of scripture here is in 1 Corinthians 13. What is 1 Corinthians 13 known as? Say it again, Olivia, real loud, so everybody can hear you. Thanks, Maya and Olivia. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is known as the love chapter. Um, the title in mine, is called, it says love is the greatest. I don't know if that's, you know, it may have variation. But we're going to start in verse 4, and it says love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful, or proud, or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. So, I'm going to leave, leave those scriptures on the screen for a moment. I want everybody to stand up. Go ahead and stand up. Stand up for a moment. And you're going to pick a partner. And we're going to take like one to two minutes. And I want you, looking at this verse, talk to the, your partner about which aspect of love sticks out to you and why. And you share that with your partner. Like, what about love? Which one sticks out the most? And why does it stick out? So talk to your partner real quick for like one to two minutes. So talk with your partner. Like, what stands out to you about love? And why does that stand out to you? So we just read about love in this in this section. So out of 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, and you can look up at the screen, what stands out and why? What stands out about love and why? All right, you guys focusing on this, or you already moving on? All right, go ahead and find your seats. So there's a couple of things that stuck out to me as I was preparing. So let's focus, let's focus. So the first thing is that love takes work. Ex expressing and staying true to all of the attributes in 1 Corinthians 13, so everything that it says that love is, is or can be hard at times. So for a moment, think about, think about your parents. Think about your parents for a moment, for as an example, and are they all of these things all the time? There are times that sometimes we get irritable. Who gets irritable when you are hungry and tired, okay? The, you know, um, who is always patient in this room? Who sometimes is impatient in this room? You know, so there are times that we are not all of these things all the time. There's times that your parents might not be all of these things all the time. And I'm not saying that your parents don't love each other, but I'm saying that they may fail, or you may fail in one of these areas, 
But ultimately, love is more than a feeling. It is a decision, and it takes a lot of work and effort. But it's awesome to consider that Jesus is all of these things all of the time. And so the other thing that sticks out about this passage is in verse 5, where it says, um, it does not demand its own way, or in some translations it says it's not self-seeking. And so... um, Love isn't about what we get out of it because love is selfless. And so, the, um, there we go. So ultim- ultimately in our culture, how often do you see people express love is selfless? Or is, do oftentimes you see people in relationships about this is about me? Sometimes our culture more focuses about us than other people, because a lot of times our first response is, what is good for me, myself, and I? What can I get out of this? What can I take away from this? But love is about putting that other person first. And so something I've noticed throughout the years is that people often misuse, I don't want to say misuse, but loosely use the word love. So think about it. In one breath, your parents may tell you, I love you. And then they turn around and tell the dog they love the dog. And then go outside, man, I really love my car. Or like, man, I really love the Chiefs. You know, people loosely use the word love. Now, they're probably not attributing the same definition of love when they say they love you versus they love the dog because they probably love the dog more. But, I'm just kidding. But how many of you have said, I love you to your mom or to your dad or to your siblings, and then you've went somewhere and you're like, man, I love tacos. Or, man, I love steak. You know? And so we loosely use the word love. <coughs> but they don't have um, the same weight or same meaning when we're using them in different ways. And so we've almost kind of watered down the meaning of the word love. And so we often limit love's meaning love's meaning to ultimately just a feeling. And now I believe that love is a feeling, but ultimately it is more than that. It is an action and it is a choice. When we limit love to a feeling, we sell it short because there are times when you don't feel loving. You probably ask your parents, you could ask any of us that are married in the room, there's times when you are irritable or there's times when you just don't feel like being nice that day but you choose to love the other person and you respond in such a way that you are loving no matter what. And so, yes, there's a feeling aspect, but there's also a choice to be made. And sometimes we really just like somebody, but we're so emotionally you know, charged in, in the feelings that we have that we call it love. And you may be like, but Pastor Sean, you don't understand. There's these butterflies in my stomach when I'm around them. And I'm just going to tell you, it's probably gas. It's probably gas, not love. I'm just letting you know that. But then there's other times where people use the word love, and in reality, it's nothing more than a selfish desire to get what they want out of a relationship, which ultimately leads to an abusive relationship where they're trying to get everything out of you for them. It's all about them, and they ultimately there's people that hurt others simply because they are selfish and they're not really loving. And so, there's times in a relationship that when it's not about the other person, when love is not the genuine meaning behind the relationship, oftentimes is where the word lust comes in. And so for many of us, when we hear the word lust, typically there is one aspect that always pops up in our thinking. And when we hear about lust, what do you often think about? Dust? You think about dust when someone says lust? Oh, okay. Awesome. Keep your mind that way. All right. But lust, often people think about um, things in culture regarding sex, pornography, all those types of stuff. Looking at images, looking at videos inappropriately, um, thinking about somebody else inappropriately. There's a lot of things that attribute to the word lust. Well, 
Well, and that's where when I was saying that it derives from the selfish desires. And so the lust ultimately has to do with getting out of the relationship what you want and not putting the other first. And so ultimately lust is something that takes place in our thoughts and our minds because it's more focused on us. So three things we're going to look at real quick is one, lust is about things. True love is always directed towards other people. You're putting other people first. Um, you're there for other people. You're choosing to love the person no matter what you're feeling. Lust ultimately is about things in which you can acquire from the other person, um, what you can have self-gratification. Lust is ultimately turns somebody into an object. It's all about you and what you can get from them. Lust is a feeling. The Bible talks about what we would call fleshly desires, which are ultimately desires that are basically our desires outside of God. And so when we limit love to just a feeling, we are ultimately in danger of leading ourselves to a place of lust. And so lust is selfish, like we've mentioned. It's focused on personal gain and satisfaction. Um, so ultimately, lust is selfish, and love is selfless. So there is a dramatic difference between these two words and these two mindsets, these two lifestyles. And in life, we can often get them mixed up if we're not careful. And so when we're driven by lust instead of love, it can have effects on us. So we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4 and see what Paul has to say. So in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17, with the Lord's authority, I say this, Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. So we read this passage. There's a few ways that we can see <coughs> how um, lustful living can affect us. Ultimately, it can darken our understanding. We can lose sensitivity, uh, sensitivity to what is wrong, and we continue to cross boundaries, sensitivity to um, putting ourselves first and not allowing ourselves to put other people first, and so we begin to hurt people. Um, it ultimately leaves us with wanting more. We want more of that gratification. We want more of that um, selfishness. Um, ultimately, you're wanting more of something. And ultimately, lust can end up controlling us if we allow it. So how many of you have heard of this concept, the elephant in the room? So we're going to put on this funny little slide here. This is a room. This is an elephant. Let's talk about it. So the elephant in the room, ultimately... When you talk about lust, a lot of people, we already mentioned, ultimately, pornography. And so this is the elephant in the room. Everybody sees that it's there. It's in our culture. It's online. There's a lot of areas in which you can look at things that are not appropriate. And so a lot of people shy away from having these conversations. A lot of people do not talk about it. But, and it can be incredibly awkward to talk about Lust, pornography, those types of stuff. And so, um, we're going to jump down here. But ultimately, there are some steps that I want to encourage you, that there are steps for somebody who's um, looking at pornography, somebody who is dealing with lust. Ultimately, number one is coming clean. When we are lusting, when we are, you know, we're using the pornography as an example, but like we've said, there are other examples in a lustful um, lifestyle, getting something from somebody else, putting selfishness first. But ultimately, when we are struggling in this way, the best way, that first step is ultimately to talk with somebody, to be honest with somebody, to admit what we're struggling with, admit that lust is a driving force in our life, and we want to dis rediscover God's love for us. Number two is get help. Some of these steps may sound kind of simple, but get help. But we don't need to face struggles, and we can talk about struggles as a whole, but we do not have to struggle by ourselves. We can go to somebody, we can overcome difficult things in our life, and sometimes it's the toughest step when we're trying to do this on our own, when we're trying to break a cycle of sin on our own, when we stay silent. 
But when we share, not like we're sharing to the entire world, but when we're going to somebody we trust, when we talk with somebody that we know, that we love, that we respect, we can begin to heal. We can begin to get help. And so when I was in college, there was this, um, I use this as an example, there was this guy on our floor who was our RA. He was kind of the, the guy in charge of our floor in college. And before he was an RA, so like when he first started call, I think he was a junior or senior that year, but his freshman year, he struggled with watching pornography. He struggled with getting online. He struggled with looking at stuff on his phone or on his computer that was not appropriate. And so he and his best friend had made this conversation and they taught or they had this conversation and they discussed how he could find help. And so he set up this program on his phone and on his computer in which anything he looked at on his computer or phone would get sent to by email his friend. So his friend could have basically once a week would get an email of everything that he was looking at online. And the deal was, if he looked at something inappropriate, his friend would then call his mom and tell him what he was looking at. And then his, he would have to have a conversation with his mom. And so they set this plan up, and he began, he, I mean, ultimately he overcame this lust in his heart. He overcame this addiction to pornography. But at first it was simply out of fear from talking to his mom. He don't want to have to talk to his mom about what he's dealing with. But as he began to spend time with Jesus, he began to spend that time he normally would on websites that were inappropriate, he would begin reading his Bible. He'd begin to spend time praying. But he came to a place where lust had no hold on his life, and he didn't desire. It wasn't overcoming via fear from his mom. It was overcoming because he loved the things of God. And so as he spent time with Jesus, and that's where last week's sermon is so important, that we are pursuing Jesus wholeheartedly, that we're putting our relationship with God first and foremost in our life. And when we do that and we begin to love God, we begin to love the things of the Lord, it is harder for sin to overcome our lives. Step number three is ultimately going back to that relationship with God, but embracing God's grace, that we can find freedom um, from lust, from sin, from you know addictions, and have freedom and victory in our lives as we walk with the Lord. And then we can set up boundaries. That we need to evaluate times in which we have bo- been most susceptible to maybe walking in temptations with whatever sin that we're dealing with, um, especially lust, and taking steps in accountability, um, having people that are account that we can be accountable to. Has anybody heard the name Aaron? Railston, I think is how you say it. Has anybody heard this guy's name? Okay, we're going to show a picture. Maybe. Has anybody ever seen this man before? (coughs) All right, I'm going to tell you his story. Has anybody ever heard of the film 127 Hours? It's a movie. Okay, so this movie, 127 Hours, is about this man in real life. Now, he did not play in the movie, but the movie is about him. See, he was a very accomplished rock climber. This guy loved to climb rock, like climb mountains. I would say climb rocks. I mean climb rocks, yeah. But mountains. So one day he is climbing um, in Utah in this canyon. And he's out there by himself. He didn't tell anybody he was out there. I mean, he doesn't have cell phone reception. Nobody knows he's out there. He's just out there by himself climbing in Utah in the mountains. And as he's climbing in this canyon, a boulder falls down and pinches. I mean, he's luckily it didn't just squash him, but it basically falls down into, the, into this little canyon thing he was in, and it fell on his arm, and the boulder in the face of the mountain, his arm is stuck in the rock. And it, the film is called 127 Hours, Because Aaron was stuck in the canyon with his arm trapped between a boulder and the mountain for 127 hours, which is five days and five hours. And he's stuck there. And Aaron gets to a place where his arm is stuck and he finally decides it's my arm or it's my life. And he forcibly twists his arm to snap it, takes out his pocket knife, and cuts his arm off. 
so that he could survive. Imagine pulling out your pocket knife, breaking your own arm on purpose, pulling out your pocket knife, and it wasn't like, I mean, I carry a pocket knife. I'll show you. It wasn't, by my understanding, it was like, like a Swiss Army knife. Like, it wasn't a solid pocket knife. This was like a little pocket knife. That was my understanding. I didn't go back and double check that. Um, but it wasn't a big pocket knife. It wasn't like he pulled out a machete and it was real easy. But just imagine having to do that. And so we're going to look at Matthew here for a moment. See what Jesus says. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 through 30. It says, you have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you, it is better than, hold on, it is better for your whole body to be thrown, rather than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And so ultimately, Jesus here is not teaching in a literal sense to where you do one thing wrong and you chop off your arm or you pluck your eyeball out. But he's teaching here these principles that you are ultimately to avoid temptations, and that by cutting off some of the items in our life for a season. So if we know there's times in which we're more susceptible to temptation, if we know there's items in which or people in which that we're more susceptible to temptations, sometimes it's going from, I can't handle a smartphone, and so I should get a dumb phone or a flip phone. Or maybe your parents can set restrictions to help you on your devices, Maybe it's taking a break from hanging out with certain people or just one specific person. Maybe you shouldn't be alone with somebody or maybe alone with technology. We can cut off things in our lives that are causing us to sin in which we can turn from that and walk with the Lord. And so Jesus is teaching this principle of here of ultimately focusing on his way, focusing on the things of him, focusing on our relationship with him, and casting out the things that are drawing us away from him, casting out the things that are causing us to sin. Ultimately, lust is selfish because it focuses on me, myself, and I. It focuses on gratification. It focuses on what can I get out of this relationship? What can I get out of this thing? What can I do for me? It's all about me, me, me. And love is selfless. It's about putting the other person first. As we read, I'm going to scroll back. Well, it's right here. I'm going to reread 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. So ultimately, love, yes, there's a feeling aspect, but love is also a choice. Because despite your circumstance, love is patient and kind. So you're choosing to walk in patience. You're choosing to still be kind despite maybe what somebody else is doing to you or around you. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. You're you're, you're choosing to not be those things even when you don't feel like it. And we could go on and we could go on. And so love is selfless, putting other people first, putting Jesus first, and ultimately pursuing him and walking in love because God is love. So therefore, how is the best way for us to know what love is? What did we say earlier? So ultimately, the best way to know what love is is by getting to know God. So spending that time with the Lord, spending time in prayer, spending time in the word, getting to know Jesus, spending time in worship, getting to know who he is, 
and what he has done for each and every one of us. And so as we get to know him, we're getting to know what love is in a greater way. And so tonight, before we, before we close, I want to encourage you, if maybe you're struggling, one, to be loving. Maybe you just struggle with some of these, some of these things in 1 Corinthians 13. Maybe you're not a patient person. Maybe you're a jealous person. Maybe you're a rude person. Maybe you struggle with some of the things in 1 Corinthians 13 about what love is. And you're like, I need to be better at being patient. I need to be better at being kind. I need to be better at not keeping a record of wrongs. I need to be better at some of these things. Then I would ask that you come to one of the leaders and, and we can pray for you. We can, we can take time in doing that. We can pray with you. We can encourage you. Maybe you're like, you know, Pastor Sean, I'm one of those that is struggling with lust. Maybe, maybe not in a big way, maybe in a big way. Maybe you are struggling with lust and you just need someone to talk to. Then I would say, come to one of us so we can talk to you, pray with you. Or maybe you're on this flip side of this whole thing and you're like, you know what, Pastor Sean, I don't necessarily struggle with loving others. I don't necessarily struggle with lust, but I struggle with receiving love from others. That there's those that aren't practicing this in my life towards me. That there's those that aren't, they're not lustful towards me, but they aren't extending love to me. And how can I better know love and knowing Jesus? And so if maybe there's people in your life that just don't act loving towards you, and maybe it's intentional, maybe it's not, I don't know, I don't have those answers. But if, if one, you're struggling to be loving, and you need to act and walk in love in a greater way, you're struggling with lust in some way, you're struggling to be loved, then I would just ask here in a moment, just, just to find one of us leaders, we're going we're gonna to close here shortly, um, but find one of us before you leave tonight and just talk. We don't even have to talk in detail. You don't have to even give full details and say, you know what? I just need prayer in this situation in my life. I need prayer just to, to be more patient and leave it at that. If you want to talk in greater details, then I would encourage you to share those with a leader, um, one of us tonight. But I just want to encourage you to do that. But we're going we're gonna to pray and we're going to close. So, Father God, we just thank you again for tonight. God, I just ask right now that as every uh, one of us in the room, Lord, as we, we kind of walk through your word, kind of walk through some topics that um, sometimes people don't always uh, want to talk about, Lord God, but I pray that, Lord Jesus, that, that one, ultimately, we focus on you, that we take time in each and every day to focus on our relationship with you and that we wholeheartedly pursue our relationship with you, understanding when, when we're not pursuing that relationship with you or we don't have a relationship with you, the relationships with others are just trying to fill the void of our relationship with our, our lack of relationship with you. But God, if, as we put you first and as we walk in love, our relationships with you, one, will grow and our relationships with others will grow. But I pray, Lord God, is if anybody is struggling with lust instead of love, if there's selfish desires in their life out of a relationship or they're struggling with pornography or they're struggling in, in many ways in the lust category, God, I pray for freedom. I pray, Lord God, that tonight they can, they can get help. They can walk to one of us. They can talk to a friend or, or a parent or somebody that they trust that can help them through this time. Father God, so I pray that you can break those chains. And I pray for those that right now, Father God, that they, they learned and they looked at what love is in the Bible, what your word says about love. And they're like, you know what? There, there's nobody in my life that really extends that to me. I pray, God, that tonight they can recognize the love that you give them. They recognize that there's people in this room, that there's leaders in this room that love them for who they are, Lord God. And so I pray that they can experience that as well tonight. So Lord, as you go before us, I pray that you give these students just wisdom this week in making their decisions and their relationships. And in Jesus' name, amen. All right. So before you leave tonight, if you need to talk to one of the leaders or you need prayer, um, come to one of us. But I have a little game to close the night out before we leave as well. So you need to stand up because who has ever played uh, Never Have I Ever? If you need a pee, go ahead. <laughs>